Namaskar. A warm welcome to World News and Indian Perspective on All India Radio. This is Gaurav Sharma and with me is R.S. Raghu bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour, we shall bring you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The Headlines Foreign Secretary Harshvardhan Shringla to visit Myanmar on Wednesday in the first high-level visit since the military takeover of the country. U.S. Congressional Report expresses deep concern over the Hong Kong Legislative Council election under Beijing's restrictive Patriots-only system. India expresses concern over the retention of Indian fishermen from Tamil Nadu by Sri Lankan authorities. France and India hold talks over bilateral, regional and multilateral cooperation at the foreign secretary level. India's Ministry of Information and Broadcasting orders the blocking of 20 YouTube channels and two websites to curb anti-India propaganda. WHO warns that the fast-spreading Omicron coronavirus variant can cripple health systems ahead of Christmas. European Commission authorizes the use of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine in people aged 18 years and above. And in hockey, India loses 3-5 to Japan in the Asian Champions Trophy final in Dhaka. As India marches towards administering 150 crore vaccine doses against COVID-19, news about the new corona variant is a cause of concern. In this situation, we appeal to our listeners to get fully vaccinated at the earliest and help others get vaccinated. Please continue to follow these three simple steps to stay safe. Wear a face mask, maintain dogas ki duri for social distancing and focus on hand and face hygiene. For any COVID-related information and guidance, contact the National Helpline numbers 011-2397-8046 and 1075. And now, the news in detail. The Foreign Secretary of India, Mr. Harsh Vardhan Shringla, will pay a two-day visit to Myanmar starting Wednesday. The Ministry of External Affairs said the Foreign Secretary will hold discussions with the State Administration Council, political parties and members of civil society during the visit. A report. The visit comes just days after a Myanmar court sentenced the deposed State Councillor of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, and former President Win Bin to four years in jail on charges of inciting violence against the military and breaking the natural disaster laws of the country. India says that it is disturbed at the verdicts. Responding to a query about the proceeding against Aung San Suu Kyi and others, the official spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs, Orindam Bhakchi, said that as a neighboring democracy, India has been consistently supportive of the democratic transition in Myanmar. He said that India believes in upholding the rule of law and the democratic process. Any development that undermines these processes and accentuates differences is a matter of deep concern. The spokesperson expressed sincere hope that efforts would be made by all sides to advance the path of dialogue, keeping in mind the nation's future. The Foreign Secretary's visit will be the first high-level visit since the seizure of power by the Myanmar military on the 1st of February this year. The visit will present an opportunity to discuss humanitarian support to Myanmar, security and India-Myanmar border concerns and the political situation in Myanmar. Anita Anand for World News AIR. China on Tuesday said that the border situation between China and India is generally stable currently and the two sides are maintaining dialogue and communication through diplomatic and military channels towards an easing of the border situation. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Chao Lichian was responding to a question on the latest situation in border areas without giving more details on the progress in the stalled border talks. As a result of a series of military and diplomatic talks, the two sides completed the disengagement process in the Gogra area in August and in the north and south banks of the Pangong Lake in February. The two sides held the 12th round of military talks on July the 31st, which resulted in the disengagement process in Gogra. 
This was seen as a significant forward movement towards the restoration of peace and tranquility in border areas, but the 13th round of talks in October failed to make any progress in the disengagement. Our Beijing correspondent reports that a day before on Monday, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi at a symposium in Beijing on the international situation and China's foreign relations in 2021 said that China and India have maintained dialogue through diplomatic and military channels. The more than 18 months long border standoff at eastern Ladakh has pushed the bilateral relations between the two countries to a historic low which was triggered by transgressions and unreasonable build-up by the Chinese military starting April 2020 and thousands of troops of both the sides still deployed in forward areas. Incidentally, on Monday, India announced its new envoy to China, Pradeep Kumar Rawat, who is expected to take up his assignment in Beijing shortly. A U.S. congressional report has underscored the United States' deep concerns about what it described as Beijing's clear efforts to deprive Hong Kongers of a meaningful voice in the December 19th Legislative Council elections. The Hong Kong Autonomy Act report to Congress released on Monday said that the U.S. concerned with China's continued efforts to undermine the democratic institutions in Hong Kong and erode Hong Kong's autonomy in its judiciary, civil service, press and academic institutions, among other areas that are key to a stable and prosperous Hong Kong. The first Legislative Council election was held in Hong Kong on Sunday under Beijing's controversial Patriots Only overhaul of the political system. On Monday, the results showed that the elections were swept by Beijing loyalists amid a record low turnout of only 30.2%, a report from a Beijing correspondent. Just 20 seats out of total 90 seats up for direct voting, no candidates from the city's opposition parties in the fray, and a record low voter turnout of little over 30%. Political analysts say the Hong Kong results are a setback for the city's democratic traditions. Officials downplayed the record drop in voter participation in patriots-only polls, while pro-democracy activists took it as a rebuke to China after Hong Kong was brought under its authoritarian grip. The move is a continuation of China's plan to tighten control over Hong Kong and push for loyalty from all levels of power following 2019's huge pro-democracy protests. Despite the criticism, Beijing looks set to move ahead with further changes to the city's political system. Anshman Mishra for World News, All India Radio, Beijing. Elsewhere, G7 foreign ministers expressed grave concern on the outcome of the Legislative Council elections in Hong Kong. In a joint statement, the countries described the elections as the erosion of democratic elements of Hong Kong's electoral system. It added that the actions undermined Hong Kong's rights, freedoms and high degree of autonomy. It called upon China to act in accordance with its international obligations to respect protected rights and fundamental freedoms in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the United States on Monday designated Under Secretary for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, Azra Zia, to serve concurrently as the United States Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues. The U.S. State Department in a statement said that Ms. Zia will promote substantive dialogue without preconditions between the government of China and the Dalai Lama, his representatives or democratically elected Tibetan leaders in support of a negotiated agreement on Tibet. In her video message, Ms. Azra Zaya expressed her commitment to promoting respect for the human rights of Tibetans and helping to preserve their religious, cultural and linguistic heritage. Direct dialogue without preconditions between the government of the People's Republic of China and His Holiness the Dalai Lama or his representatives is essential to resolve differences and achieve meaningful autonomy for Tibetans. We also seek to increase access for U.S. diplomats and other officials, journalists, and tourists to the Tibetan Autonomous Region and other Tibetan areas, reciprocal to the access PRC officials and other Chinese nationals enjoy in the United States. The PRC must also cease its harassment, intimidation, and surveillance of Tibetan diaspora communities in the United States and elsewhere. Such acts known as transnational repression, undermine our collective security. 
India has expressed concern over the detention of Indian fishermen from Tamil Nadu by Sri Lankan authorities. 68 fishermen and 10 boats have take, have been taken into custody. The official spokesperson Narendram Bachchi said that officials from the Consulate General of India in Jaffna have met the detained fishermen and are providing all necessary support. He said the High Commission in Colombo has taken up the issue of early release of the Indian fishermen and boats with the government of Sri Lanka. The External Affairs Minister has received representations on this issue from various political parties. He was also called on the matter by the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. He has apprised them of the current situation and underlined the government of India's efforts to secure an early release. The Ministry of Information and Broadcasting has ordered the blocking of 20 channels on YouTube and two websites spreading anti-India propaganda and fake news on the internet. The ministry has requested the Department of Telecom to direct the internet service providers for blocking of news channels and portals. The channels and websites belong to a coordinated disinformation network operating from Pakistan and spreading fake news about various sensitive subjects related to India. The channels were used to post divisive content in a coordinated manner on topics like Kashmir, the Indian Army, the minority communities in India, the Ram Mandir and General Bipin Rawat among others. The modus operandi of the anti-India disinformation campaign involved the Naya Pakistan group operating from Pakistan having a network of YouTube channels and some other YouTube channels. Some of the YouTube channels of the Naya Pakistan group were being operated by the anchors of the Pakistani news channels. These YouTube channels had also posted content related to the farmers protest and the citizenship amendment act and tried to incite the minorities against the government. The World Health Organization WHO has warned that social mixing during the festive season will lead to more cases of the COVID-19 variant and potentially overwhelm health systems. In his virtual media briefing on Monday, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus cautioned against the fast spreading Omicron variant of the coronavirus. There is now consistent evidence that Omicron is spreading significantly faster than the delta variant and it's more likely that people who have been vaccinated or have recovered from covid-19 could be infected or reinfected there can be no doubt that increased social mixing over the holiday period in many countries will lead to increased cases overwhelmed health systems and more deaths Meanwhile, the European Commission authorized the use of the US-based Novavax COVID-19 vaccine in the EU on Monday for people 18 and over. This paves the way for a fifth coronavirus jab as the Omicron variant spreads in the region. The decision comes days after the EU drugs regulator, the European Medicines Agency EMA, had recommended its approval in over 18. Meanwhile, India's health ministry has said that COVID variant Omicron is three times more transmissible than the Delta variant. The center has advised the states and union territories to activate the war rooms and keep taking proactive action at the district or local level. This is All India Radio giving you the news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. <laughs> The government of India is observing the Good Governance Week from the 20th to the 25th of December. The Ministry of External Affairs also marked the occasion. In today's hotspot section, we bring you the remarks by India's Foreign Secretary Mr. Harshvardhan Shringla at the 8th edition of the Good Governance Day celebrations. The Good Governance Week being celebrated this week as part of the Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav is not just an opportunity for us to recount some of the initiatives taken up by the government in the last years it is also an occasion to reflect on how we can further improve outcomes introduce innovations effect efficiencies and economies and identify best practices that can be replicated and scaled up it is a privilege to receive guidance from the external affairs minister and the ministers of state for external affairs in the session held earlier today The ministers have reaffirmed the importance that this ministry and its network of missions and posts across the world accord to the dictum of minimum government maximum governance. 
articulated by the Prime Minister. They have also reaffirmed the centrality of the idea of diplomacy for development in our operations. The choice of topics that we discussed today, passports, Vande Bharat, Vaccine Maitri, International Yoga Day and Ayurveda Day and innovations in missions and posts today give us an idea of the breadth of this mission's operations and its changing and evolving nature. The Ministry of External Affairs runs a worldwide public service delivery system that delivers passports, visas, OCI cards and a variety of consular services. An enormous effort has gone into implementing the Passport Seva project to improve service delivery and applicant experience. The Ministry has succeeded in making the process of obtaining a passport simpler and faster. The Mother Portal, launched in 2015, provides for online registration, resolution and tracking of grievances by Indians in distress abroad. The e Sanad Portal, launched in 2017, facilitates online verification of the documents with an objective to extend contactless, cashless and paperless document apostille service to applicants in India as well as abroad. The Global Pravasi Rishta Portal, launched in 2020, is a single point platform for sharing information, linking embassies and consulates with the diaspora. It provides information on consular services, events, governmental initiatives while seeking feedback. I'm also happy to inform you that the Ministry has embraced technology in its international function. Internal platforms such as the Meadows are moving us in the direction of a paperless office. The COVID pandemic was a health catastrophe that impacted severely on billions of citizens in lost lives and livelihoods. The Ministry of External Affairs, like the rest of the government and society, was faced with an unprecedented situation. It responded with agility, with speed and scale to the extraordinary challenges that it was confronted with. A COVID cell that worked 24-7 was created to coordinate our COVID-related operations. This was resourced appropriately and coordinated with our diplomatic missions and multiple stakeholders in India and abroad. Amongst other things, it worked on the Vande Bharat mission, the largest logistical mission of its kind ever undertaken. It played an equally essential role with the Government of India's empowered groups to mount a global procurement operation to source critical medical supplies during the first and second wave of the pandemic. We were also represented on the National Expert Group on Vaccine Administration for COVID-19 and in the task force on the COVID-19 vaccines. I do not believe that this is the last time an interagency response of this magnitude would be required. This capacity to react flexibly and to scale up rapidly in a short time will be central to our effectiveness in the years to come. As such, the COVID cell has now been institutionalized as the rapid response cell of the Ministry of External Affairs, a recognition of the long-term responsibility that health emergencies and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief emergencies will place on our diplomacy. The Vande Bharat mission is a case study in governance response to an unexpected challenge. It was a complex interagency process that was unprecedented in its size and complexity. The entire population of Indian nationals stranded in hundreds of locations was mapped using technology-driven applications. They were assigned priorities, flight schedules and manifests were worked out. The capacity to process arrivals had to be repurposed pandemic realities. SOPs for handling passengers returning from abroad, including protocols for quarantine, etc., were generated. Departure processes around the world had to be navigated. These are just some of the challenges that were faced by the government. The ministry worked closely with other ministries of the government and state governments during the pandemic. As the world began to unlock and reopen, the ministry worked on the next steps. It facilitated air bubble arrangements to assist the movement of passengers. It has also worked on the mutual recognition of vaccine certificates that allows Indians to travel safely and with reduced or minimal inconvenience. As of today, we have understandings with more than 100 countries in this region. Indian missions and posts abroad reacted with speed to assist Indians after the COVID-19 related restrictions were imposed. The assistance varied based on the needs of the people. The 24-7 COVID emergency helplines that were set up were also uh, there to help Indians in need. Missions worked on a timely dissemination of local government guidelines on health, preventative measures, provided medical facilities and facilitated travel logistics. Missions managed logistics at the point of departure. They played an important role in arranging chartered flights. Other services extended from the supply of masks and sanitizers to food kits uh, to uh, communities that were stranded. In several places, aid, boarding and lodging and even tickets in the most deserving cases were arranged. These initiatives were conducted by missions using existing resources such as the Indian Community Welfare Fund and by leveraging partnerships with the local Indian community and other local entities. 
another contemporary case that demonstrates the need for flexible and rapid response capacity relates to procurement. The country confronted acute and often crippling shortages of medical products and essential medical supplies during the pandemic. The ministry worked with the Department of Pharmaceuticals and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in facilitating procurement of essential medical equipment required to overcome domestic shortages. Missions and posts abroad were the global arm of this extraordinary. During the first wave, they coordinated and executed a global sourcing operation to tide over the situation. This was parallel to and also supported the process of scaling up domestic manufacturing capacity to meet demand and supplement the health infrastructure. Procurement and logistics during the second wave proved to be much more daunting than the first. With rapid increases in cases, the supplies and products were required at short notice and on an emergency basis. A global effort to source critical supplies such as liquid medical oxygen and essential drugs such as remdesivir and amphotericin B had to be mounted literally overnight. The procurement effort was accompanied by logistical efforts unprecedented in its size and complexity to get the supplies to location in the process. It was a whole of society effort that added a civil society and private sector con to a whole of government effort. The ministry has developed a strong orientation to economy and business outcomes. The Prime Minister, during recent interactions with heads of missions abroad and with stakeholders in trade and commerce, has given concrete directions on how this ministry's network of embassies uh, can work to further the goal of promoting the three T's, trade, technology and tourism. The economic diplomacy operations of the ministry are being re-engineered and reoriented with a sharper focus on outcomes. Our missions and posts are working energetically in engaging stakeholders, domestic and external, public and private, government and non-government. A contemporary example of this new orientation in our work with the vaccine industry during the second wave of the pandemic. We work to secure supply chains through diplomatic interventions in important capitals, securing raw materials, accessing technologies, etc. Public diplomacy outcomes are another area where ministry has a strong focus. India is a civilization with a distinct ethos. An entire public diplomacy effort that is coordinated on a global scale has been created to work on the promotion of uniquely Indian subjects such as yoga. The International Day of Yoga, which is now celebrated across the world, has become a movement. The promotion of Ayurveda and of national milestones such as the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, the 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak Ji, the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. Events to commemorate and celebrate these are planned and executed on a global scale. Action plans, publicity plans, budgets, etc. are coordinated across missions and posts worldwide to deliver enhanced public diplomacy profiles. Our people are our greatest economic asset. The Ministry of External Affairs has focused on supporting Indian workers being abroad. Pre-departure orientation training helps migrant workers know about the culture, language and regulations of the destination country to ensure their safety and security. I had the opportunity to attend one such training program conducted by our branch secretariat in Mumbai, and I found that it was extremely useful to those who are traveling. Uh, this sort of program also informs our workers about resources such as the Indian Community Welfare Fund, Pravasi Bharatiya Bhima Yojana, e-migrate portal, Madad portal, Pravasi Bharatiya Sahayata Kendras, 24-7 helplines at the Indian embassies and consulates, online PDOT implementation. Through effective use of technology, would allow women and other prospective migrants who are in remote locations and are not in a position to attend the training in person to benefit from such programs. I would like to end by reiterating the determination of the Ministry to adopt the letter and spirit of good governance. We will make every effort to become more transparent, more open, more responsive and more accountable. Thank you and Jai Hind. Secretary General, Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France, Mr. Francois Delatre, is on an official visit to India from December the 20th to the 22nd. The visit comes on the heels of the annual defense dialogue held on the 17th of December in New Delhi between Defense Minister Rajnath Singh and his French counterpart, Ms. Florence Parley. Foreign Secretary Harshwadhan Shringla held bilateral talks with the Secretary General on Tuesday. Both sides took stock of the bilateral relationship and discussed the potential for cooperation in sectors such as defense and security, space, cyber security and the digital economy, blue economy, education and people-to-people -people contacts, energy, health and climate change. Ambassadors of India and France joined the talks. 
to tap the full potential of bilateral trade and economic relations, both sides reiterated their commitment to restarting negotiations on the India-EU Free Trade Agreement, reaffirming their shared commitment to a multipolar world and faith in multilateralism. The Foreign Secretary and the Secretary General also held discussions on a number of regional and global issues of mutual interest, including cooperation in the European Union in view of the forthcoming French Presidency, Indo-Pacific UNSC situation in Afghanistan among others. Moving on to sports, defending champions, India on Tuesday suffered a 3-5 defeat against Japan in the semi-final of the Asian Champions Trophy men's hockey tournament at Dhaka. India will now face Pakistan for the bronze medal playoff and Japan will face South Korea in the final. And now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Globe and Mail reports, UK says COVID-19 situation extremely difficult as Omicron variant sweeps Europe. The Guardian writes, Sweden brings back tighter curbs. German experts recommend maximum contact restrictions. Sputnik News reports, Russian President Putin says US is to blame for tensions in Europe. Financial Times writes, Putin says, Russia prepared to use its military to counter hostile NATO. Tolo News reports, Philippine death toll from Typhoon Rai climbs to 208. South China Morning Post says, China calls on U.S. businesses to play a bridging role as trade talks stall. The Washington Post reports, French strike kills top Islamic State militant in West Africa, blamed for deadly attack on aid workers. Khalid Times writes, hospitalization rates low despite rising COVID cases, says UAE official. And the Japan Times says, government warns that a huge quake of northern Japan could cause hundreds of thousands of deaths. And before we end, let us take a look at the headlines once again. Foreign Secretary Harshvardhan Shringla to visit Myanmar on Wednesday in the first high-level visit since the military takeover of the country. U.S. Congressional report expresses deep concern over the Hong Kong Legislative Council elections under Beijing's restrictive Patriots-only system. India expresses concern over the detention of Indian fishermen from Tamil Nadu by Sri Lankan authorities. France and India hold talks over bilateral, regional and multilateral cooperation at the foreign secretary level. India's Ministry of Information and Broadcasting orders the blocking of 20 YouTube channels and two websites to curb anti-India propaganda. WHO warns that the fast-spreading Omicron coronavirus variant can cripple health systems ahead of Christmas. European Commission authorizes the use of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine in people aged 18 years and above. And in hockey, India loses 3-5 to Japan in the Asian Champions Trophy semi-final in Dhaka. India is celebrating the 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnavjan, by artists from Cuba.
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.